Welcome to the Intune Guitar Academy. This is part two of my interview with Michael Dola. Mike is, among many other things, an elite level judge in mountain bike racing, or to use the correct terminology, he's a commissaire. In part two, we have a much more in depth look at the intricacies of organizing and running such complicated events. We pick up our conversation where Mike describes one of his favorite events, a World Cup race held earlier in 2021 at Snowshoe, West Virginia. Get the really good events. The last event I did was the uh, was a, a mountain bike World Cup in Snowshoe, West Virginia. That yes. was two and a half weeks ago. Okay. And they did, they originally had a, a cross country downhill and a cross country short track. And then because of a cancellation in Europe, COVID, mm -hmm. um, uh, the, the, the Fort McWilliam in uh, Scotland got cancelled and they asked the organizers in Snowshoe if they could do their round of downhill. So we did a full downhill, a second full downhill, a uh, cross country short track, and a cross country Olympic. And you were there for in a week, eight, right? I was in there. I was there for eight days. Yeah, it was that one was a long one. I took a week vacation. Mm -hmm. you know. And but long that days, one, right? Like uh, ten hour, oh, ten twelve hour yeah, days. Yeah, like we're six thirty in the morning briefing marshals and uh, finish the the meetings at uh, usually seven thirty eight o'clock oh, at night. Right. So it's it's sometimes fourteen hours. Hmm. Right? And that that was one of the best events I've ever been to. Really, absolutely, it was so good. And, and like the judging for mountain bike racing, I guess part of it is making sure that they stay on the track, that nobody cuts yep, the corners. That's or a anything. part of it. Yeah. So when when we go to an event, for example, for a cross country, the technical delegates responsible for delivering the course ready to race, but I also inspect the course. So we do that together usually. So we walk the course, we make sure that everything's in place, there's all the rules on how you're supposed to tape the course, if there's directional arrows. We also check for safety, sometimes we'll add padding, sometimes we'll change lines. We want to make sure that the course is rideable in any condition, whether it rains or not, even if it snows, they have to be able to ride the course. So we go over all of that, and then once we make sure that, that it's, it's all done, I sign off on the course, the TD signs off on the course, and then we're ready to start practice. So we always do that before practice to make sure everything's safe. And it's that, the same thing for a down, right? And how many uh, World Cup events have you done? You know, I was trying to count that the other day. I think I'm at, as the chief commissaire, I believe I'm at seven. Well, okay. Very but I've also organized seven. Okay. Because after that 1993, when I became a commissaire, the president of the, the bike club here in Bromont decided that he wanted to get big and start organizing World Cups. So we did World Cup in 93, we did in 94, we did in 97, we did in 98, we did in 99, and then we did 2008 and 2009. So we organized seven World Cups, as well as eight Masters World Championships from 1999 to 2007, and two of which we actually exported to Western Canada. We did those in uh, at Sun Peaks uh, outside of Kamloops in, in British Columbia. Fascinating. So that's that's one of the reasons that I'm I, I'll just I'm pretty good at being a commissaire because I understand all of the facets. I know how to be. A, I was a technical delegate nationally for two years in, in the late 90s. Uh, I was an organizer. I've been a commissaire for this will be my 30th season next year. Mm. So you, know, you get that perspective because very experienced. Mm. Yeah, and, and when we started out doing this, just like on the road side, it was very rules driven. So you would drive it based on the rules. You would react to situations where riders didn't do what they were supposed to, teams and organizers, you'd give fines, all that kind of mm. thing. And we've evolved over the years, especially in the past five or six years, to where we're trying to be partners with all the stakeholders in the sport now. Mm -hmm. So as a commissaire, we want to come in and help make the sport better. So we want to anticipate things that happen and help make them not happen rather than react to them afterward. And how does your experience as a commissaire help you in your real world, like in your job and your life around the house and so on? And I'd say that, that one of the biggest things that I've learned through the commissaire role is dealing with people. Mm, okay. And that's that's the big key. And you learn a lot about how people react under stress, how people react in in different situations, how, what people's motivations are. And you learn to read people, which you know, you're in sales, I'm in sales. We, we learn very quickly that you need to read people so you can adapt your approach to the way that they need to hear things. 
So over the years, uh, being a salesperson and also five years as a sales manager, I've brought a lot of my experience from the mountain biking world into managing people and managing relationships to the point where I've developed an approach to figuring out what type of personality you're dealing with and how to recognize their style, their defense mechanisms, and then strategies to get them out of their defense mechanisms so you can move forward. And I use that the color sales, colors, yeah. the color, the color yeah. wheel that I've developed. It's 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 like Myers Briggs or whatever. There's okay. a, there's a whole bunch of those out there. I've just taken elements of a whole bunch, put it in into my version of it, with strategies for action. That's really simple that you can teach in about an hour. That helps people deal with situations, and and that I find has been the most valuable thing for me. Mm. You know, and it, it works. It's kind of both ways. The mountain biking, the sales, and they fed each other right, to create right. something, right? And then how, uh, describe your experiences in Rio and describe your experiences in Tokyo. Well, how the ultimate, they differ? yeah, the ultimate experience, the ultimate goal for someone, and, and we talked about wanting to be world class in something, the ultimate goal for any athlete, official, coach, team manager is to get to the Olympics. That's the pinnacle of, of any amateur sport. So I can remember sitting in the living room of our house in Roxton Pond, which is another town about 20 minutes from here. A village of about 20 people. Yeah, you know, it's, it's, it's about a <laughs> thousand, but yeah. And uh, with my mom, who, was, who loved sports, my mother was, was, she played field hockey back in the 50s and was a pioneer for women in sport. Anyways, and we're sitting there watching the 1976 Olympics in Montreal on TV. And I remember turning to my mom and saying, you know, mom, one day I'd like to go to the Olympics. And her answer back was pretty typical. She said, well, Mike, once you get old enough, you can buy yourself a ticket. You can go to the Olympics wherever they are in the world. And I said, well, no, no, I want to be in the Olympics. I want to be part of the Olympics. And she said, she just kind of giggled and said, okay, well, yeah, whatever. Well, there's a lesson in goal I setting. Made it. I, I got there, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So goal setting. And sometimes those goals will lie dormant. So when I started commissaring for mountain biking, it's not because I planned to get to the Olympics. It's I just did it because I thought it was really cool. I always need to be on the inside. I need to be behind the stage or beside the stage to see what's going on behind it. That's what I like. Mm. So getting in onto the inside of these massive mountain bike events to me was really fun. And... When mountain biking got into the Olympics in 1996, that's when myself and everybody else started going, oh, well, wait a minute. Hmm. Possibilities. Possibilities yeah. here. So I started working on getting to the national and getting to the international and building my credibility because even though there's 80 odd international mountain bike commissaires worldwide, there's really five to 10 that the UCI entrust with the major events. Okay. And getting into that group requires a lot of years and it requires the right attitude and, and the right skills and everything like that. And, and I've been there now for about 10 years. And what does the so, UCI stand for? Union Cycliste Internationale, which is the International Cycling Union. So it's basically the governing body for cycling worldwide. So it's the group that, for example, the Olympic movement goes to the UCI to do the cycling events in all the disciplines. Okay. Just like soccer would be, what is it, FIFA? FIFA yeah. yeah, or, or in the, it's FIA for, for automobile right. racing. Yeah. There, there's there's government the bodies. Yeah. yeah, it's the federation. And, and the way it works in, in cycling and in most others is, like, I'm not a member of the UCI. My national federation is a member of the UCI. I'm a member of my national federation. Oh, right, okay. Right, so that, that structure, it, it comes into play when you're trying to move through the stages of, uh, you know, officiating or something. So how did Rio differ from Tokyo? Is it well, more chaotic? Yeah, well, Seems Rio... chaotic from far away. Yeah, Rio is chaotic at the best of times. Yeah. I've been to Rio many times because I've been there for races on several occasions. And it's funny because everybody expected Rio to be chaotic at the Olympics and it was actually the other way around because they had made agreements with all the gangs and the favelas. They had set up uh, reserved lanes all through the city, the hotels, the city was on its best behavior. So the least chaotic time I've ever seen Rio was during the Olympics. Oh, really? It yeah. was amazing. It hmm. was so good. And the, the agreements that they had with all of the criminal gangs was don't mess with the international tourists. And it held. So unless you went looking for trouble, you weren't going to get in trouble. So the, the Olympics in Rio 
obviously were very exuberant. We got to go to the closing ceremonies. We got to go to the Olympic House, uh, Canada Olympic House, because as an international official from Canada, we got the invite. I actually was there the night of the Tragically Hips last concert. Oh, really? Watched it on the giant screen in Canada's Olympic House. Well, in there you New go. York. A music-related topic. In there you this go. This is the so. Intune Guitar Academy, after all. And yes. if you don't know the Tragically Hip, well, I'm, I feel sorry for you. You need to find One that of Canada's out. best ever rock and roll bands. Yes. They say that uh, Gord Downey was Canada's unofficial poet laureate. There and go. there's definitely yeah. truth to that. So you should look them up. So I got to watch the, yeah, so I watched their concert from the Olympic House. The, the, the event was amazing. There were 14,000 people there for each day of racing. They, those were paid tickets. And the, the vibe was just crazy. Hmm. The, the, yeah, the Brazilians know how to party, my friends. They're very <laughs> good at that. It was, it was just amazing. So as I was saying, the Olympics in Rio were, were exuberant, crazy. The, the, you know, the, the Brazilians, they know how to party. So it was a very different experience. So when I found out I was going to Tokyo in what would have been 2020 if it had happened when it was supposed to, all of us going, because out of the people that I work, because commissary is always a team. So it's minimum of five. The panel is five people for any given race, but mm. then we have assistants that help us. The biggest teams usually is around 12 for world championships. So the five of us that went to Rio three of us were repeating in Tokyo. So we started planning. We knew what to expect from the Olympics. We were going to go there a couple of days early to Tokyo. We were going to hang out and visit Tokyo. We were going to then all of us stay afterwards. I was going to go to South Korea to see my brother who lives in Incheon. All of that ended up going away. But we never expected Tokyo to be as exuberant as as Rio. I mean, Rio is the party capital of the world, right? right. And especially yeah. in the middle of a pandemic. So the Exactly. So what ended up happening is the 2021 version of the games, we got noticed that we had to fly into the Tokyo airport, get tested while we were there, and then go on to our venue and stay within the Olympic bubble. And then as soon as our event requirements were finished, the following day we had to go back to the airport and we had to fly out. So no free time. I know. Like so, the, the Olympics in Tokyo was a pretty weird looking event. Very Olympic subdued. Because there was nobody in the uh, audience and you could tell as soon as, the, I think it was the same for all the athletes because you only saw the athletes that were directly involved in that event. You didn't yes. see anybody else. No, uh, no wives, husbands. And, no, Because exactly. I, I know a lot of the athletes, they... Well, you, you, they travel with people that support them. Yeah. And then as an athlete or an official, the, the, the accreditation you get is what's called games family. And when you're games family, you're allowed to visit any other event and you can go right down to the field of play. Right. So for example, when I was in Rio, the BMX track was within walking distance of the mountain bike. So one day we managed to go over and watch one of the final, we watched the women's final of the BMX because you know the events weren't happening at the same time. Okay. The women's final happened on one of the practice days for mountain bikes, so I managed to get free and go over, and I could get right in and go talk to the other commissaires and be beside the, the start gate because I had that games family access. Mm. But in Tokyo, none of that applied. We weren't allowed to, we weren't even allowed to leave. So it was the racetrack, the hotel, the racetrack, the hotel, go home. Yeah. That was it. What I find the Olympics has become a lot more fun to watch because they've added yes. sports like BMX and yeah. snowboarding and the the four uh, the four person snowboard yeah. race the yeah. snow cross I think yeah. they call it snow cross that exactly. is the yeah. most In the fun games, event yeah. to watch. Yeah. I wouldn't want to be part of it, but it's a lot yeah. of fun to watch. <laughs> Lots and of then, crashes and people flying all over the place. And BMX must BMX be a lot is like the that. Yeah. And then the other one of the other sports they added this time was the uh, skateboarding, but the oh, right. but the artistic skateboarding. Yeah. So dancing on a skateboard and all the stuff in the, uh, in the yeah, you get what I mean, the half bowl thing there, whatever. That's the, not the snowboarding thing, with yeah. the, the yeah. acrobatics. The half pipe. I love watching those things. So that's so Tokyo was was it was good nonetheless because mountain biking was one of only three sports where they did allow spectators. So we had six thousand spectators yeah. there for both of the race days because it was outdoors. Okay, and they were able to socially distance. So it was quite something doing the race with spectators, which had not happened at a big mountain bike race in two years. Hmm. So it, it was it was kind of cool, but the, but the Japanese, the organization, just perfect. Yeah. Perfect, it was so well organized. 
you know, not that Rio wasn't, but it's just it's just another uh, level. Just a Japanese different level just, of organization. Yeah. Yeah. And the the volunteers and the infrastructure and how everything was planned out, it was just perfect. And the racing was good. There were some really interesting stories that came out of Rio. So if you uh, not Rio, but Tokyo, if you watched any of the mountain biking, the infamous Sakura drop that had a wooden ramp after a rock that dropped during practice and had been declared in the organizing guide, in the tech guide, in the, the team managers meetings that that would be removed for the race. And the favorite, the guy who was expected to win, forgot oh. and went down on the first lap and did basically what we call a Superman. And there's all sorts of memes online. Oh, because, no. <laughs> well, because he flew off the back of his bike or something. Well, he flew off the front of it. But yeah. he, if if he had crashed and then accepted, or as we say in French, assumé that it was his own mistake, everybody would have had sympathy for him and, and would have rubbed his back and patted him in the back and said, oh, that's too bad and we feel for you. But then he got onto social media and started oh, mouthing off about how he didn't know that was going to happen and the organizers were disorganized and how could the commissaires do that until his own... <laughs> until his own Team manager up again. <laughs> on uh, on Velo News the next day in an interview said, "No, no, no. We had told him at least twelve times. We're going to tell him to shut up now because it was his own fault. Oh. His own team manager." So, mm. thank well, I you. think uh, any, Vanderpol, look it up. That anybody who wants to bitch about something on social media should probably leave it for about 12 hours or overnight At sleep least, on it maybe yes, yeah yes. because and then in the women's race yeah. um two of the favorites were were battling for position on the first lap and the girl who was leading the race came to that same drop we had put the ramp back because it had rained overnight and the conditions got slick so it became dangerous we had to make a whole bunch of changes to the course to make sure that it would work the conditions became dangerous they in did. a mountain bike race Okay. Oh, but yeah, but remember, cross country versus downhill, okay? Yeah. And that's one of the things that, that I always address when we're talking about mountain biking. People's minds, they think about these crazy guys wearing full face helmets and body armor going downhills and bouncing off trees. That's not the Olympic sport, kids. Okay. The Olympic sport is the cross country Olympic. It's an endurance event, lasts an hour 20 to an hour 30. It's 25 to 35 kilometers of riding up and down, and the riders are basically dressed exactly the same as they would be if they were running riding in a road race. Mm, okay. So that it's an important distinction because people get that wrong all the time, and it's not Red Bull Rampage where they're doing backflips off of cliffs. That no, <laughs> no, that's not the Olympic sport, kids. It's not. I ride cross country Olympic, and I don't want to kill myself. So yeah, yeah. yeah. Because I have a friend, our, our mutual friend who's fallen off his bike a few times yes. and he's had some pretty incredible accidents and that's what I think about when I hear mountain biking. Well, yeah, but he, he's he's doing a lot of downhill. Okay. So he wears that full face helmet and the body armor and the knee pads and everything like that and he rides down the hill, but he's also a very good cross country rider so he's in very good shape. So yeah. he does kind of a combination of both, but you'll find that, yeah, most of the bad accidents are going to happen during downhill. Like, for example, a week and a half ago when I was at the, the World Cup in, in Snowshoe, West Virginia, they, we had two rounds of downhill. And in each of the three-day rounds, because you do two days of practice and a day of racing, in each of those three-day rounds, we had riders evacuated by helicopter to the local wow. hospital. Okay. Yeah, yeah, like broken femurs, uh, collarbones, stuff like that. Because it's, it's much more of an extreme sport than the cross-country would be where... You know, it happens, but it's it's not really yeah. the same thing. Well, I mean, road biking has its share of oh, accidents, course. too. I've seen, like, the, the Tour de France this year. Somebody no. came up with a, a sign and yep. caused a major accident yep. and nearly killed one of That's, the riders. And... I've never been... I'm, I'm a national road commissaire, they tell me. Yeah. Don't give me chief of a road race because it would not go well. I don't know enough about road racing. But I've, I've officiated at many road races, and I cannot understand how road racing can be run the way it is with, with the spectators that close. Yeah. If you look at the Tour de France and how close the spectators get to the actual riders. Yeah, that, that woman walked right into the, the just race. And took out the leaders of the race with a sign. Yeah, yeah, and she, she was found it. and she was fine, right? Arrested, and, right? Yes, yeah. she was arrested and they find her and yeah. 
But in, for example, that type of situation for us would be during a downhill. Mm -hmm. The course is taped and then there's a second level of tape outside of it that we call the B zone to stop people from doing that so that they won't get hit by a rider or by a bike or if there's a crash or something like that because that's just crazy. Well, but those guys are going fast. Like, how going. fast do they typically ride? The guys, the highest speed that was clocked at the World Cup I did a couple of weeks ago was 72 kilometers an hour. That's like 40 down. miles an hour. Yes, right? that's very, very fast. Yeah. Yeah. Very yeah. fast. I could show you pictures of the track and you wouldn't believe they were going that fast on that track. Okay. Yeah, it was like bombed out rock. It was crazy. Yeah. But these guys are the best in the world. All right. Well, I think we've covered enough about the Olympics and sure. mountain bike racing. And I got to say, thank you very much. It's a very enlightening interview. A lot of things I didn't know about. Yeah. And, uh, so if, if just, just to wrap up. Yeah. If you have a passion in life, there's two paths that you can take. Many people will say that if you have a passion, turn it into your work. And that way you're never going to work a day in your life because you're going to be doing something that you love. But there's another thought process behind that. The other thought process is, well, if you take your passion and turn it into your work, well, then work isn't always fun. So you can also keep your passion outside of work so that it remains a hobby. Because if you turn your hobby into your job, you've lost your hobby. I've had many occasions to go full-time into cycling in different capacities and I've always turned them down because I want to keep the passion side of cycling for me and I do my work side as something completely different. I'm passionate about the work that I do. I work in health and safety. I help keep, keep people alive by selling them the right products so that in the situations where, that they face during their work days, they don't get themselves killed. So there's an element of passion in there too, mm -hmm. but it's not nearly the same as what I do Just for my a different right? level. And yeah, so, so turning your passion into your job is not always the best thing to do. Sometimes it's better to keep it as your hobby because that way you have a much fuller life. That's kind of how I started the Intune Guitar Academy because yep. I love writing, I love photography, videography, guitars, we yep. play in a band together, yep, I love to do. play music. But I don't know if I want to make a living out of any of them, but it's just something I, I like doing and I, exactly. I was able to combine all those passions, all those hobbies yep. together to make this YouTube channel and make my blog both of the same name, yep. In Tune Guitar Academy. So thanks very much. Mike thanks Jordan, for having me. And I uh, really appreciate the interview and we'll see you Great. again on the In Tune Guitar Academy. Or on a bike. <laughs> <laughs>